Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Donut of Destiny, the podcast on all things cardiac CT for anyone interested in cardiovascular imaging. My name is Praveen Ranganath, and I'm a radiologist in Dallas, Texas. Today, we continue our series on building a cardiac CT program. I am joined by my colleagues from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, Dr. Jerry Breen and Dr. Eric Williamson. Jerry and Eric, welcome onto the podcast. Thank you for the invite. Uh, Glad to be here. Of course, of course. Thank you both. Before we get into the topic itself, let's get a little bit more introduction from both of you. Can you give us a quick biography with a focus on your journey in cardiac CT thus far? Jerry, why don't we start with you? Okay. I finished my residency in 1988, and probably my favorite area in radiology was angiography. So I had planned to do a angio-interventional fellowship here at Mayo. Then in my senior year, I was approached by the sole cardiac radiologist we had at the time, Paul Julesrud, who was practice was strictly limited to the angio room for pediatric congenital disease. And then also the chairman of the department and Patrick Sheedy, who is kind of a pioneer in CT. And we had just obtained an electron beam CT scanner, the Imitron, and we were just obtained, you know, MR, and we were done a very few congenital cases on on a resistive magnet, but they said they really needed someone who wanted to pick up the focus of adult heart disease with imaging, and uh, would I be interested in going to a fellowship someplace in the world and learning more about the heart? And at that time, there really were only two places that radiologists were training other radiologists in, in heart disease, and that was at the Harvard system and at Stanford. And well, Sanford had much better weather, so I decided to go there. <laughs> so I, I, in my year there, I, I did regular angio because that was part of the fellowship, but I uh, had a fair amount of time in the cardiac cath lab. They did not have pediatric cardiac fellows, so I got to do all the kitty casts. We did coronary angiography. We read all the coronary angiograms. And I got a fairly good background in just basic cardiac imaging, traditional methods. We had a resistive magnet at Stanford that they were doing congenital hearts on, and they had just obtained the latest and greatest new 1.5 Cigna from GE. But the volume there was very low. I mean, we were probably doing one or two MRs a week, and that was about it. So it wasn't a whole lot of volume there. But attending all the conferences, uh, all the cath labs, imaging and, and, and outcome studies gave me a pretty good background to come back to Mayo. So I came back to Mayo then and in 89 and joined Paul Julesrud, and now there were two of us. And the way the administration structuring happened back then, they decided to have everybody had a division. So we had the smallest division. We had two people, Paul and myself. My emphasis was going to be adults. His is still the kids. But he, Paul really didn't care for CT much. And we had just, like I said, obtained the Imitron, and that business was starting to take off. So I got involved in those cases, but it wasn't, I wasn't assigned to cardiac CT or cardiac MR that day, because even then there were maybe four or five cases a day in CT, mainly coronary calciums and like structural things, pericardial disease, masses, things like that. Oftentimes it was a, we see something like echo, we don't know what it is. Can you see it? And in the past, they were kind of doing maybe a rare MR, which I also then would do. But we quickly learned that the CT, especially something that could do that quick of imaging for the, elect- the electron beam, that we did a lot of structural findings on CT. So that business just slowly grew. And I mean, slowly, I mean, I was running between angiograms, conventional angiograms to go do a CT or an MR. And when it got to be, the volume was just big enough. We said, we got to need a half day assignment for myself to just do the cardiac. Well, that grew to a full day assignment. And then we had a full day assignment and then grew. I said, I need a second line, so I need more people. So that's when we started adding people like Eric. A number of other people had backgrounds, some not from traditional cardiac imaging fellowships, but from MR backgrounds and as well as cardiothoracic CT programs. And it just grew. And from then on, it was just a steady 45 degree up as far as volume. And we kept adding lines, so we kept adding people. And we got to the point where we are today, we have a lot of people, we have a lot of lines doing a lot of cases. So it's been a very progressive, and it's not a revolution, it was an evolution with us with CT. I've always said that about CT. 
that when people discovered CT, they thought it was something new. But no, we've been doing it since 1988, 1989. Mm -hmm. So then I uh, officially retired in February of 2020. And within like two or three weeks, Mayo was cutting salaries. They were letting people off. They were wearing masks. So I, said, I guess I had quite an impact when I left. <laughs> but you know, because of COVID and my retirement plans out the window, and the fact that Mayo's business kept growing, mm -hmm. and we lost some people who decided not to come back to work. They asked me to come back supplemental. So now I'm doing one or two days a week, and I'm doing strictly either cardiac CT or vascular CT. Mm -hmm. Jerry, phenomenal. There's a lot more to that origin story in terms of specifics about the hardware and the software and the sites that I want to get into. But before we get into that, Eric, why don't you introduce yourself and talk to us about your journey through Cardiac CT? You know, it's uh, thanks for being. It's you know, it's really humbling. Of course, I've I've heard some of Jerry's story, but it's it's amazing. You know, the the story of cardiac CT at Mayo Clinic is linked to the story of Jerry Breen, right? I mean, it's his career story is really the story of cardiac CT here, and I'm I'm excited to get into more about the the hardware and software as you've talked about. So I rent, entered into the story relatively late in the game, right? Jerry already had established a, a bustling cardiac CT practice before before I got set to do my fellowship. But my entry into the field is pretty similar, frankly. I always thought that I was going to do interventional radiology. The, the only real reason I went into radiology was, was to go into the cath lab and, and spend my time you know, doing, doing vascular studies. But, but partway through my, fellow, my residency, right, which was the late 90s, early 2000s, there began to be this evolution or continued evolution that, uh, that Jerry talks about in both cardiac CT and cardiac MRI. You may remember that was when steady state pre-procession and MRI happened. That's when late gadolinium enhancement was first mentioned on the MRI side. And that same time, of course, that was when some of the spiral CT advances occurred. And so I had a very similar situation to Jerry, where I was approached by a member of our staff who said, would you be interested in, in going external and spending a little bit of time learning more about spiral CT and what it can do, particularly in the in the vascular practice? Is that something that would be of interest to you? And I, I remember back in 2003, sitting in Jerry's office and, and saying, I have this opportunity to go do a fellowship, same place you did at Stanford. When I come back here, would you be, you know, is, it, is that something, would you be willing to have, have me join the division? And Jerry said, yeah, assuming there is a division, when you, by the time you get back, we could certainly find a space for you. And so that's, I, I had, a, again, a similar entrance where it was, it, it really is, right, the, the overlap of somebody's interests and the developments that are occurring at the time in our field that provide kind of these unique opportunities. And, and I, I was felt privileged to be able to come back and join as the fifth member of a, an already very robust cardiovascular imaging faculty here. And it was, as Jerry mentions, you know, kind of the, the, the rest has all been an upward slope since then. Yeah, this is, this is fantastic. It's super interesting to hear about the origins not only at your institution, but in cardiac imaging altogether and how these kind of were united in their growth. I'm envisioning a, an electron beam CT somewhere tucked away in an imaging department in the late 80s. And now, well, what do we have now? Let's talk about that growth from the initial stages to now in terms of who was doing the exams, where we're doing the exams. Is it just at a single institution or have we grown to multiple what sort of hardware and software implementations have we had? Jerry, if you wouldn't mind starting us off, and then Eric will touch with you as well. Yeah, you got to go back before the electron beam CT. And here at Mayo, we had the first cardiac computed tomography device. That was called the DSR. Now, a lot of your audience probably hasn't even heard of electron beam CT, but I'm sure very, very few have heard of the DSR, the Dynamic Spatial Reconstructor. This was something that was built in the early 80s by people from our biodynamics research units who, who had the engineers, we had the infrastructure to do this. And to explain what a DSR was, you kind of take an idea of what current cone beam CT is, make it massively large with an unbelievable number of x-ray chains on it, on something that I think was an old Ferris wheel that they bought. And they put on 28, <laughs> 28 image intensifiers, a tube, and this circled around the patient. So it was a spinning gantry. And this thing had the capability 
uh, performing, generating 264 images per re- revolution in millisecond reconstruction time was 1 60th of a second. So we, we were talking down to about 15, 60 milliseconds. Mm. And so this was absolutely phenomenal. This thing was big with 14 X-ray tubes. You can imagine so. You knew when they turned it on because all the lights in Rochester had it. Turned <laughs> off the it was massive. And it was great except for one thing. The images were crapola. No, I, I don't think crapola is allowed, but but I'm going to stick with it. You can bleep it out later. I'll bleep later. it out. I'll bleep it out. <laughs> and actually, there was very little radiology interest in it because we said, this stuff, these images aren't worthwhile. And it turned out to be a good research tool, primarily doing animals. There, there were, I think, a couple pediatric congenital cases done. This is well before my time. And again, my kind of mentor and partner at the time, Paul Juzer, said, ah, we're not this isn't going to fly. And there were some kind of really interesting papers out there saying the emperor has no clothes with this male dynamic spatial reconstructor and uh, really kind of negative <laughs> that came from within the institution. So that's really something. It was the only one ever built. We did license it to an outfit in uh, Japan that never built one. So it was a one-off. It stayed plugged in almost until about 20 to our year 20 zero. And, uh, it was primarily though, just doing animals. Mm. But at the time, I still remember the world news showing a beating heart on, it was on, maybe it was, I don't know if it would be Dan Rather, if I was even before his time showing it. And everyone thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Now, if you'd show that image today, you go, holy smokes, that is worthless. But at the time, <laughs> it was something. So anyway, this thing made some news. And there was a guy from San Francisco University, San Francisco, named Doug Boyd. He was a physicist. And he came out and visited the the DSR. And I remember he said to Paul Jules, he says, I can do something better. And that's when he built the, the electron beam CT scanner, mm-hmm. which had no X-ray tubes. It's this massive cathode ray tube that swept uh, electrons over a big tungsten ring underneath the patient. Mm-hmm. And you got images. You got, got CT. So we got not the first electron beam, but we were about number three. And we started, this was what Pat Sheedy was doing. Uh, my, older colleague and we started doing not only the coronary cals which was one of the first exams that this thing took off with but we started doing a fair amount of structural heart disease Mm -hmm. with electron beam especially when mr was failing that you're not old enough to remember the early days of mr when you were having 264 matrix images and you know you get four slices in five minutes and you had to put everybody practically to sleep sleep if they weren't an adult and the images were not that great Mm-hmm. But I remember one of the first images that I generated was somebody looking for pericardial disease. And not only did I see the mitral valve quite well, but I saw cordy quite well. And I thought, wow, this is giving spectacular quality images. But the big problem with the Imitron, though, was that that was about an 80-pound-year-old lady with absolutely no subcutaneous fat. Mm-hmm. So the signal noise was always marginal. It was the first CT scanner that was ever FDA-approved to do coronary imaging. But nobody really cared about FDA approval. The 64s were out, but they tried to make a big deal out of that. But anyway, we, we, did, we did not do standard coronary angiography other than for coronary anomalies. It was a great machine for coronary anomalies. And again, the quality of the images could be quite nice on a young patient. The temporal resolution was great. The reconstruction times were pretty bad. We would do a dynamic study. We were looking for LV or RV function. And we'd scan the patient in just a matter of a couple of breath holds. We'd go to lunch and come back 30 minutes later, and they weren't reconstructed yet. So it was, it, was, it was not a high-output scanner. But speaking about function, back in the early days when ARVD was an infectious disease back in about 1990, and everybody who ever got a cardiac MR was told they had right ventricular dysplasia. Mm-hmm. And we kept saying, no, that's not right. The, the, these images are not right. They're trying to overread fat and all this. So our first really big jump from pericardial and coronary calcium disease was we were Minnesota's referral then for ARVD. Mm-hmm. And it started more often than not when people up in the Twin Cities, St. Minneapolis, St. Paul, came down with that diagnosis. They had already gotten a, a defibrillator, so they got in a box, but it never went off. And they called back and said, do you think this guy really had ARVD? And so we could do a, an Imatron scan. And we go, no, I don't think he has, has it at all. And so we all of a sudden got, because everyone who got an MR for ARVD got that diagnosis, we started building that practice. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, kind of the Imatron era. 
when the 64s hit, we had the first 64 in the country. I remember my first reaction was, geez, this is pretty good. Mm -hmm. Especially if you get a decent slow heart rate, we could do diagnostic coronaries. Back then, we were more interested in ruling out disease rather than trying to truly quantitate the disease. But that's when the coronary business started to grow steadily. Then, you know, we do uh, other things with CT, and, and, but it really took off till when we had the first dual uh, tube system in the country, and we had the first flash system in the country, and we realized we can start doing a lot of things, uh, a lot of functional imaging, not just anatomic imaging. And here again, the practice just grew till we now got the recently have gotten the uh, photon counting CT, which is, it's, it was a little bit of a time gap from when the next last big jump was. Mm-hmm. but. This is now, I think, another significant increase in the quality of the imaging, and it's going to have more and more applications, and it's just going to get us more business. So that practice always grew. It's back in the early days of, of spiral CT, when especially we've got 64 row scanners, it seemed like about every four or five years, something new would come out. And when something new came out, we started doing more and more scans. The practice just kept building and building. And now, like I said, it's a busy practice. Mm. This recap of the history makes me feel like, you know, Mayo has been pioneering in terms of every step in cardiac imaging and specifically cardiac CT over the past several decades. Many of our listeners are certainly aware that the Mayo Clinic is a premier academic institution in the Midwest, sees plenty of referrals from the area, but would like to get a little more context about a unique component to the Mayo Clinic that some of our listeners may not know about. Eric, can you provide some perspective to those out there that may know about it as a large academic center, but may not know some of the, the nitty gritty about what makes the Mayo Clinic unique? Yeah, Praveen, it's it's a fun place to work because of exactly what Jerry has just outlined in terms of the where it's come from and and where how it has been really at the at the forefront of a lot of these developments. It, it may or may not be something that your listeners are are familiar with, but this was the institution that got the first CT scanner outside of London in England. I guess it was right outside the London area in England. The the second CT scanner ever, the first one for full-on diagnostic use, actually sits in a hallway exactly down one floor from where Jerry and I are sitting right now today. It's still, it's still on display. And, and so the, the history of CT and the history of, of Mayo Clinic radiology are really inextricably linked. And I think Jerry has very nicely outlined you know, kind of how that, how that has worked, particularly with regard to cardiac CT. And we've We've just been super fortunate in that we've we've always managed to be among the, if not the exact first, among the first in terms of early adoption of new technology. And the same thing is happening with the photon counting CT. Now we have uh, a couple of young guys who, you know, as as Jerry and I kind of step back and hand pass down the torch. I know you're well aware of Prabhakar Raja, uh, important colleague of ours who is really spearheading the ongoing work that we have in, with regard to photon counting CT and coronary CT angiography. As Jerry mentions, and as, as your listeners will know, every time we have a, a jump forward in technology, we begin to see things that we haven't seen before. And I think the next thing that we're really going to be able to do, we're all going to, we're already experiencing this, but I think we're going to really continue to experience the explosion in, in particular in plaque imaging and b- more broadly in the cardiac sphere tissue characterization using CT. And, and I think really beginning to, to move into what has previously been understood as kind of MRI territory. So that's, uh, it, again, lucky to be here and happy to be to be part of these ongoing uh, evolution revolution in cardiac CT. Awesome. Let's start diving a bit more into the current clinical practice there at the Mayo. Who are your readers in terms of cardiac imaging at present? Are they radiologists? Are they cardiologists? Are they a mixture of both? And and in line with that, how do you continue collaboration between your readers and your reference in terms of continuing the evolution and revolution, as you say, in cardiac CT. Yeah, absolutely, Praveen. This is, and again, this is a continuation where we are now and how we got here is a continuation of the practice that Jerry and Paul Jolsru built back in the day through the first, I'd say about dozen readers that we had here for cardiac CT. 
they, those were all radiologists, right? We were we were initially a radiologist shop, but Jerry collaborated with some of our colleagues over in in cardiology to develop a combined training program that trained both radiologists and cardiologists. And now today, as our service has grown and our, and the cardiovascular division now comprises, depending on how you count, roughly twenty, say twenty two cardiac readers, two of whom are cardiologists. So although that's a, you know, it's kind of wildly swung toward radiology as compared to cardiology, we consider this to be a collaborative practice between both radiology and cardiology. We certainly consider those readers to be full-fledged members of the cardiovascular radiology division. They attend our division meetings and they help us with decision-making. And I think that incorporation, right, the early work that Jerry did in collaboration with cardiology, but not just cardiology, with vascular medicine, with vascular surgery, with cardiovascular surgery, to, to build really deep relationships with the referring cardiologists, attend their conferences, invite them to our meetings, et cetera. I think that that collaboration and, and maintaining those, frankly, very personal relationships with the referrers has really been the key to, to growing and developing the service. And, and that's where we stand now today with regard to our volumes and with regard to our number of read readers is testament to that, uh, those, those strong, robust, and ongoing relationships. You know, the overall growth took a long time because initially, cardiology didn't like to accept cardiac MR or cardiac CT much. I mean, we have one of the world's best echo labs, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And we would be busy, more busy, and busier early if they weren't so good. We also happen to have a very good nuclear lab mm. and a very good cath lab. So when you're, you know, a lot of institutions might have a great one or the other, but we were extremely lucky here in that it was kind of all bases were covered. Mm -hmm. And because all bases were covered, we, there was a reluctance to let the new kids play. Mm. I remember even way back in CT of the aorta and uh, at a vascular surgery meeting, and I said, you know, that catheter angiography of the, of the aorta is dead. And they just railed against me. and said, how can you possibly say that? It's blasphemy. And they go, you just watch. I mean, why in the world do you have to put a catheter in just to look at the aorta? Then it's just to look at the great vessels. Then to look at the renals. Mm -hmm. None of those need catheter anymore. And now it's evolved into you don't need it to see the coronaries most of the time. Mm -hmm. But it, it was a slow process of accepting that. And once they realized, hey, there's something here, we got a lot more interest from them. Yeah. So we uh, agreed to start. There were rotations through our Department of Cardiology Fellows. It's incorporated into their routine cardiac fellowship program. Everybody comes and spends months now with in CT and MR. Yep. And then we started also some years ago a two-year non-invasive cardiac imaging fellowship program, which is open to both radiologists and cardiologists. Now, the majority of those people have been cardiologists because they kind of see that more as I can then cover all areas of my practice with this. We have a little bit harder interest in getting radiology residents inter interested because it is a two-year program and they can go out and find jobs if they just have, you know, they get quite a bit of cardiac experience while they're residents here. Most of them go out and feel very comfortable doing imaging at their, you know, eventual practice, even if it was in a little bit smaller institution. Mm -hmm. So it's the training involved and the interest involved. And one other thing that, that we started was echo conference. I mean, as in the early years, and all of us have always attended almost every cardiac-related or vascular-related conference in the institution. So I would always be at the echo conference. And when there would be a CTR and MR that asked my opinion, and normally at times I'd kind of give them some gas and show how much better we were than echo. <laughs> but like I said, they're, they're good. They're really good. And then we said, you know, to make this evolve a little bit faster and get more people interested. At the beginning of every echo conference, there's the first of all, the quick imaging case, which is a case we pick one week would be picked by radiology, the next week would be picked by cardiology. And they're all supposed to be kind of interesting cases where we used a variety of different modalities. So now all of a sudden, if we had somebody who had, was there a question of left atrial appendix thrombus? And they'd show the echo and they said, well, we think there's one there, but there's a lot of dense echo smoke. So we got a CT and we proved on delayed imaging that the appendage was completely clear or that there was clot. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was an attempt to show, let's do correlative imaging. And so you don't always need to do something like a TEE to look for, for left atrial appendage thrombus. And that practice has really evolved where 
originally that was that was heresy again. You can't you can't rule off clot in the heart without DE. And I go, oh yeah, you can, and I can prove it to you. And we showed them case after case where we were right and they weren't. So now, like our ER comes in, somebody with a stroke. The stroke protocol includes cardiac imaging to look at the aortic arch, left atrial appendage, left ventricular apex, and they don't bother to go on to get TEE. So it's been a again a, a gradual evolution, but the interest from cardiology has spurred mm-hmm. our training and our our involvement in the imaging cases on a on a daily basis. So the goal was to let's eventually get to a point where we're going to have a non-invasive cardiac imaging center a building that has all the non-invasive procedures involved and modalities because someday it's going to be you're going to get x amount of dollars to make a diagnosis in this patient so you can pick you want to do a calf and a and an echo or do you want to do an echo and a nukes or do you want to do just an mr i want to do just a ct that hasn't happened yet we've made two attempts to get the institution to give us a building and both failed and once again i hit you know End of the career, I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to be Moses. I'm not going to try and create the, the promised <laughs> land and then not get to participate. So it's still an ongoing concept. We we kind of have that idea, but we don't have it in our own building. And there's so much cardiac imaging down here. I know we could survive greatly. And when we're going to be forced to do it so that we can't spend money on every one of these exams, you, you just should. You just got to do the right thing. Mm. I remember at the after a few years of doing this conference, I got up and I said, "Let me let me have the day today," and I showed case after case after case where we had nukes, MR, CT, cath, and if they had any more money left, we'd we'd do a PET scan too. <laughs> and we go, "All right, guys, let's look at these cases. Do we really need to be doing this?" Because I then I'd put all the costs mm-hmm. of all those, and you look at the cost of the imaging was just getting to be outrageous Mm -hmm. so let's try and figure out what's the one test or two tests that we can do to get our all the information that we need and i think that's only going to happen once you have true non-invasive cardiac imaging centers Mm -hmm. jerry and eric my takeaways thus far has been trailblazing interdisciplinary and multimodality in terms of the programs that you've built jerry you have created this really from its inception. And Eric, you've helped foster it to a a level that's servicing a tremendous number of patients now. I'm curious to get an idea as to the cross-section of a normal clinical day now. What have we come to in terms of the total volume? What types of cases are you typically seeing in terms of the highest volume? And what's your ratio approximately of a normal to an abnormal type of case? This is a great question, Praveen. And, and before we logged on, Jerry and I just pulled up our, you know, our, our daily work list today, just to kind of get a get a sense for what is a normal day. And t- today looks relatively normal. There are low eighties, eight zero total number of cases across the the various staff who are reading today. About fifty of those. Remember, we're a combined cardiovascular service, so about fifty of those are cardiac only, specifically geared toward the heart, and about ten today. But I would say probably a dozen is more more usual for the number of specifically structural heart disease cases. So that's a that's a big part of our practice, and we have one dedicated individual who today their only job is to read structural heart disease cases because. As you know, Praveen, those take a, a fair amount of time to uh, to kind of shepherd through the system and get the post processing. With regard to the cardiac specific cases that are that are non structural heart disease, there are that probably the largest number, at least today, is coronary calcium. We have a very robust practice in that regard for preventative cardiology. So coronary calcium, coronary CT angiography, pulmonary veins are three big ones I know today. And we have, we, as you know, we have a uh, robust triple rule out practice here through the emergency department. But this is a pretty typical day today. So far of those 80 some 80 some cases, only one of them today so far is a triple rule out CT. Because since that's an ED based system, ED-based practice, we don't really see those cases until later in the day, right? So this afternoon, they will start, you know, the ED will start adding those cases on, and then they'll go into the evening. We'll, if it's a normal day today, we'll end up with, say, 10 or so 
triple rule out CTs that will end up getting added on specifically through the emergency department. And one of our lines on the schedule, one of the that the one of our readers today is works the evening shift, and it'll be that person's job to to supervise the residents in till this evening, say nine or ten p.m. However late they end up staying, supervising the residents reading the triple rule out CTs. One of the things, and, and Jerry didn't mention this earlier, but one of the things that he was really key in setting up was the extended hours cardiac CT service, which is super important, right? Because if you, it's hard to make the argument that cardiac CT is crucial for the evaluation of chest pain patients and then not make it available when patients have chest pain, right? It's just something that obviously we struggle with, right? That's every part of medicine, certainly every part of it, emergency medicine. So it was some years ago that Jerry basically helped train the residents to be able to handle cardiac CT in the evenings and that just to make it easy for them, that that tends to be triple rule out CT. That's those are the cases that get done to evaluate uh, emergency department chest pain. And I'd hate to say it's twenty four seven, but it's basically twenty four seven. If you want a cardiac CT, if you want a triple rule out CT from the emergency department at four a.m. on you know on a Sunday, you can get it. The folks who are there in the middle of the night are capable of performing and reading those studies. That that's not to say they're super happy about it, but they're absolutely capable of doing it. That's that was a big part of the educational system that that Jerry pushed and others in our practice pushed that that made it possible for us to continue to expand the practice is that any time day or night that you want a study you can get it and our residents are are an absolutely huge part of that right their ability to handle handle these cases in the middle of the night is is super important and that's been a big part of the of the growth and success of that program Eric, this is incredible. There's so much to unpackage from there. I, I want to first focus on something you had mentioned initially about your normal days, 80 CTs. For a lot of practices out there, both within the country and outside of the United States, that is a tremendous number. So could we first get an idea before we jump into what you had discussed about triple rule out exams of where these exams are coming from? Is this a single site or multiple sites? And how many readers do you have to have on staff per day to service 80 CTs? Yep. It's a great question, Praveen. And, and you know, this is something I, I know that you're, I'm sure you have struggled with in your practice, but it's, it's, it's big for us as well. I don't have a very comfortable day when I'm trying to read, say, an abdominal CT and a cardiac CT and, a, you know, vascular MR all in the same day. We don't like doing that in our specialty. We'd like to stay subspecialized if that's at all possible. So we have dedicated readers who are focused on different parts of the practice, and that's super, super, super important to us. It takes about six of those folks to get through those cases on the on a day, and that includes our evening shift. So the the cases, those eighty cases, right? They'll all be read before that evening person comes in, right? That the evening person is going to end up doing mostly the add-on cases, the ED cases, the triple rule cases, the resident cases that that happen in the late afternoon and the evening. That'll be their responsibility, kind of the the sweeper to take care of everything at the end of the day. Like I say, it takes about six people on a given workday to to manage that entire workload. And you know, when we think about, you know, so how did you, how did you get to eighty cases a day? Is Jerry talking? about it at the beginning you know it's it was a little bit slow going in the in the early days how did that happen exactly i'll tell you that the biggest factors right with regard to the growth in the practice over over time has been the fact that that jerry and the program that he built if somebody says hey can you do fill in the blank here the answer is always yes yep you need us to work weekends yep no problem you need us to cover a call you know to yep absolutely you need us to consult on a difficult case from an o- that's going to come down directly from the OR and go right back up yep yep the culture that he built is to always say yes to expand the practice first and then look for the resources to be able to cover that practice and as a result there really has been a, a thread of good stewardship of resources from the very beginning with regard to the the way that we have grown that uh, have grown that practice over time so it's again it's been fun to watch my little bit of the evolution of it and look into the future what's coming you can tell me if you agree but the affable available and able seems to apply very well to jerry what do you think 100 percent, 100 percent. that's a misconception <laughs> <laughs> i have three kids that all work for mayo clinic so they kind of know the culture and they keep saying dad how have you ever avoided being called on the carpet by hr <laughs> you've never been to town school and you need to go <laughs> you know, you know, amazing I know we're not, we didn't specifically address the turf issues, but I mean, 
for us to get to the size we are, we are now too big to fail. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't always in the early days. So you had to make sure that you were providing the service that the cardiology and the cardiac surgeons needed. And you provided quality images and correct interpretations. Mm -hmm. So that it, that came down to it. So, it, you know, this wasn't just handed to us. We mm -hmm. had to fight for it. And uh, mm -hmm. I think we've done a pretty good job holding on to a, a, a practice that, that, you know, it kind of really is just centered in radiology. So we're a huge moneymaker now for, mm -hmm. for radiology. Back in the early days, we were probably the lowest division for RVUs. And now I think we're getting to be, we're probably even exceeding the neuro guys. And they all is cheap. So uh, <laughs> yeah. we have to work for it. That's right. <laughs> Jerry, that's that's fascinating. In fact, I feel like programs that even I have seen and been a part of building from the ground up recapitulate that exact idea where it seems at first that it's a little tough to justify creating this new, somewhat expensive service line. But once you provide a high quality service, your cardiologists and your surgeons see the value and they continue to help grow it together. So could not agree more. And I think it still happens to this day. Obviously, you both have a very mature program, but with some of the newer programs around the country, it's still going on. And it's it's exciting to hear that this is a, a story that's been told before. Eric, you've, you've described in a good deal of detail your triple rule out workflow. I wanted to get into that a little bit more because it's pretty unique in terms of your offering. Where did the need come from? How was it initially developed in terms of the conversations with your cardiologists and your ER physicians? And, and how do you go about performing these exams in terms of coordination from when the patient arrives with acute chest pain to reporting exam? Yep. Yep. It's a, it's a great question. And there, there have been tons of folks on, on our side who deserve the lion's share of the credit for for developing and growing this this service, but one individual that I, I would like to call out in particular is Nandan Anavaker. He's one of the he's one of the first cardiology fellows that we trained in our practice and then brought on staff with us to work as a as a full member of our staff. And I remember when Nandan was going through and doing his fellowship, he of course seeing the cardiology side of the chest pain evaluation realized that that not infrequently. You know, a patient would come into the emergency room, they draw, they do an ECG, they draw a troponin, they'd send them over to CT for a PE study. And and this, you know, this is something, of course, that's driven Jerry crazy for years. But but Nandan decided during his fellowship that he was going to quantify the number of times that you had a patient with uh, who got an ECG, got a got a troponin for chest pain, and then got a pulmonary embolism CT. And he just counted and he said came up with on average, it's about three a day you know, that met this criteria that that kind of didn't make sense. Then, you know, after they get their PE study, which is invariably negative, then they go back and they would sit overnight in the chest pain unit and wait till the next day so they could be tested, They'd do a stress test, usually, usually nuke, sometimes echo, just to determine whether or not they had a disease that we could have ruled out the night before using CT. So the, he basically presented this data gave his account of the way that these patients were currently being managed and then kind of stated for all of us, wouldn't it be better if there were at least an option for these patients to get a rule out of the disease that they're clearly being evaluated for earlier in the process? And so as a lot of the, you know, our, our colleagues, of course, at William Beaumont and other places, and certainly the, you know, the Romicat trial was coming out about the same time. So, so we were, the evidence in the literature was beginning to accumulate as well, that there, there was a role for cardiac CT at, at an absolute minimum to rule out disease in these patients. And, you know, it, certainly in some cases being adequate to determine, you know, what could be a significant stenosis and triage the care of those patients. So that was, that was kind of how it was presented to us. You're already doing all the pieces of this workup. If you would just change the acquisition technique of, of one of these studies, we can give you much more information than you would normally end up with. And when it was initially conceived of, it was intended that this mostly be the triple rule out practice, mostly be an ED chest pain evaluation. When there weren't people who would be who would be super capable in reading just a coronary CT alone, but it has evolved over time. And like I say, it's a it's a robust part of our practice. In terms of technical aspect, we don't administer beta blockers to those patients. We, of course, do give them nitroglycerin. And, and the image quality, I will say, if there's a limitation, the image quality, because we don't beta block those patients, is a little bit, maybe the diagnostic yield is maybe a half a skosh less than it would be, you know, in our outpatient practice, you know, when we can really control heart rates and et cetera. But 
it's a bustling and it's a growing part of our practice. Some people love it. Some people hate it, but our customers love it. And that, that has to this point been kind of the, the ongoing driver in the, in, in why we perform that, that particular practice. I, I would like to make a couple comments about if you want to get started in a triple rule up program from your ED, and if they're going to be the same way our ED is, they don't want you giving beta blockers. I wouldn't even <laughs> want to try and do this with a standard 64 row scanner. We've got all dual tubes. You know, if somebody has a heart rate of 80, we can still do okay with that. But since they don't want to slow in the heart rate down, that's a limitation. Mm. As far as it being a success, this has been a true Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde story on several points. Mm -hmm. One of the most negative papers about using triple rule out scans in the ED, it was kind of primarily addressing this is overusage of resources. This is too much radiation, too much contrast, even though the radiation, the contrast isn't that much greater than just a regular PE. Uh, it is because we're always using now retrospective gating our ED patients. But it's kind of funny, one of the most negative papers came out of Mayo Clinic. Mm. And it came out of a combination of ED doctors as well as the people who looked at test utilizations. And I went up to one of those guys and I go, hey, he's an endocrinologist. Hey, look, I don't tell you how to manage diabetes. You don't <laughs> tell me how to image people from the ED. Well, from that point, it went kind of 180. It's We've gotten to be a little bit too successful because mm -hmm. right now, I mean, sometimes when you got the right two or three ED doctors in there, if somebody has a vowel in their name, mm -hmm. they're going to get a triple rule out CT <laughs> or anything with shortness of breath or, or you know, chest pain. And if they have a vowel and a consonant, you're going to extend it into the abdomen. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I always think about how somebody comes in, they really haven't been evaluated too well, but we are so good at ruling out anything that's going to kill the patient or what might be causing their pain that they utilize this a lot. Mm -hmm. But I do want to talk about one specific indication that I kind of go, all right, this is an example of, of maybe we're getting, we're getting patients really there. When you see the referral, it's from Judy, and she's the desk attendant at intake. They're not, they're <laughs> not, you know, they're not seen by anybody, even a med student yet. And they come directly from the waiting room into the CT scanner. Mm -hmm. But there was a gentleman in his like 60s who had a previous MI and had an LED stent, nice big LED stent, who came in with left shoulder and left arm pain. And I guess the concern was, is this angina equivalent? Mm -hmm. He was so inebriated, though, that they really couldn't get a very good history out of him. Anyway, he got the triple rule out. I was reading him that night, and this is one of those cases where the study came out just beautiful. Mm -hmm. The LED stent was perfectly large enough that I could see inside. I'm going, there's no reason for this patient to be having chest pain from PE or coronary disease or aortic disease or pneumonia, nothing. So I was just ready to click off, you know, sign. When for some odd reason, I looked at the little scalp view, and his left arm and shoulder pain was coming from a dislocated left shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. so I thought, uh, <laughs> that's probably a little too much overutilization. But sometimes it's crazy. You get the, the right ED doctors, we just, you know, they're coming every 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they always start about three o'clock. So yep. it's been successful, but it's also been, it's a, a little bit of a resource drain on, on our CT scanners. And we have, what, five or six CT scanners right next to the ED, and, and several of those are capable of doing cardiac. And yep. we tie up a lot of resources. And that's, you know, they don't even like us giving nitroglycerin because it slows down the, you know, we, you know, and that's just by a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's been a good thing and a bad thing. And I'd say it's, it's overall, you know, if I was coming in there with atypical chest pain, it's probably what I'd want. You know, so I like to treat people the way I'd be treated myself. But sometimes you just kind of go, whoa, we're doing a little bit too many because the uh, percentages of positive, you know, are really low. Really low. Really, I don't know. You know, our PE study positivity went from like 20% when we used to do pulmonary angiograms down to about 5% when we did cardiac C or vascular CTs on people. And I would say also that majority of people who are coming in for chest pain we're, we're truly ruling out all three plus other things. So you have to balance the, how much good we did and how efficiently we did it to how much we're spending. Because, you know, they take two breath holds and their bill is in the many thousands. Yeah, it's a it's really interesting point, Praveen, because as you know, as, as Jerry's pointed out, you asked this question earlier, what percentage of positives do you have? And, and of, of all of our populations, it is that ED triple rule out population that is the most likely to, to have have a negative result. Nobody comes to the structural heart disease 
practice without a disease, right? 100% of those cases are positive for something. And, and I would say our vascular disease patients are, are similar as well. There's no question that, uh, you know, that many of the patients that we see for, for coronary CT angiography, many slash most, have at least some degree of disease, whether functionally significant or not. But that ED patient population is not infrequently, as Jerry points out. Uh, those are the negative cases that can be sometimes, sometimes a little cringy to read. But it, again, it's been, I think it's, as Jerry points out, it's been a successful program overall, particularly since it, it makes the, the workup, I think, more efficient for the folks who are some of our most important customers. I got to tell you, I, I think all of us have the utmost respect for our emergency department practitioners, but there are those ABCs of emergency medicine that arrive, begin CAT scan. And this is this is just something that's pretty common across the country as CT becomes more available. At your institution, it sounds like there are trainees that are really on the front lines managing these emergency department patients. I, I, I myself and many of my colleagues, while we have great trainees, we have reluctance from our trainees to involve cardiac imaging in the emergency department or inpatient imaging in terms of coverage. It sounds like you have built a very robust training program in which your trainees are integral to the emergency department care for acute chest pain or any sort of cardiac imaging for that matter. Yeah. How? How did you do that? <laughs> yeah. it's, a, no, it's, a great, it's a great question. And, you know, as, as with many of these questions and the, and the growth of these practices, there is, you know, some apocryphal story. And I remember very distinctly, we were very nervous about this exact issue when we first put the program in. And Jerry gave a series of lectures to the, to the trainees so that they could, you know, kind of be prepared. Here are the practicalities of reading one of these studies. Here's how to, you know, get through a stack of images in a relatively short order, et cetera. A bunch of practical considerations. But the other thing that we did at the time we had, we had a lot of fellows in our practice. And so we told the fellows that they were going to have to cover a call patient pager because our residents were going to have to, at that time, we didn't have an evening shift. So after 5 p.m., the fellows on call carry the call pager and they would be responsible if, if, if and when a triple rule out CT occurred, they needed to go in and take care of them, you know, whatever level of support the residents need. And I remember that we'd done, we'd had this on for maybe a week and there was a triple rule out study, you know, 10 PM or whatever. I came in the next day and I noticed that it was a resident who's a you know third year radiology resident who had read that case in the middle of the night, despite having never seen one you know, during the day at that point, hadn't done a cardiac rotation yet. And I called him up and I remember saying, Hey, Nate, you know, there's a fellow on call. Right. You're, you're aware. Right. We've, we've got this. We've got this. This number is posted in every reading room in the ED. We have a fellow on call who's designed to help you with this study. Oh, by the way, incidentally, perfect read on that case. But but you know, there's there is a resource for you to for you to avail yourself of. And I remember him saying, you know, I, there's no way that I'm going to call somebody to help me with a case that's my responsibility. And I, I just you know, I remember I remember where I was when I took that phone call. I thought. I think the training program is going to be all right. You know that, <laughs> right? I mean, this is a this is a resident who absolutely took responsibility for those cases, and that's this is a culture that Jerry and I didn't build, but but that we benefit from of people who who are taking responsibility for the for the stuff that's happened in the night. We of course want to support those folks, and and I think having a staff in house now in the evenings is is helpful. But I think there is a culture among trainees that they want to be able to handle what they see on call and, and what they see through the emergency department, that that's a, you know, just like they took on PE studies back in the day or dissection CT or whatever it was, that this is it's just the next step in that evolution. That's honestly been super fun to watch. We, we also have a staff that's always on call too yeah. for further backup, but I think the staff only get called in on kind of complex cardiac MR cases rather than CT. You know, our, we correct them some cases in the morning and, mm -hmm. Thankfully, most of the residents, if they're going to make a error, they're going to kind of err to, I think there's more disease there than what I'm going to read it as. Yep. And usually we're in first cases, are we're in early in the morning, and we'll stop people from like eventually going to the cath lab. We say, no, I don't think that's really necessary. And uh, you know, so we're putting out an amended report. So that at night, they only put out a preliminary report. So the staff know that somebody's, uh, the clinicians know that the staff is going to do them. But overall, they do fairly well. We do have another colleague, though, has really, Phil Ross, who's really taken yeah. this teaching business uh, to heart. And he makes sure that all the residents, before they start call, we start our cardiac rotations now on first-year residents. So they 
see our busy days right away. So they're seeing uh, those, you know, many cases a day. They're getting a pretty good handle on them, even as a first and a second year resident. They won't do the evening shift until the third year residents. But Phil also has a large number of cases where he has CT, angio, like maybe echo correlation and outcomes. So we, we want them to make sure they go through all those. So overall, they, they do a pretty good job. And one of the reasons why we started the evening shift was just because the volume had gotten so large. Yeah. But the volume of everything from the ED is so large that we had other staff complaining that our residents were using too much of their time yep. doing these triple rule exams. So at after 10 o'clock at night, they start to slow down usually. So it's like after the evening meal or something like that, or evening news that people had to come in. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's not been horrible. We haven't made horrible mistakes that I can see. Excellent. As we come now to the end of our conversation, I want to talk about the future. What sort of growth plans do you all have for the program at Mayo, and how are you planning to accomplish these goals? Yeah, that's it, it's a great question, Praveen. The, the last big move, we've alluded to both of them, but the, the, the two recent expansions we've had where we've added another reader during the day have been the evening shift and then the structural heart disease practice. And, and we see a ton of growth in continuing in both of those. We're getting about to the level where I think we're, we're bumping up against capacity in the hospital right now during the day and then during the evening, those readers cover both inpatient and outpatient CTs. And so we're going to need to split that practice, right? That I think the next growth for us is going to be to divide inpatient and emergency department work and have dedicated folks who are devoted to that. And then we need to create additional capacity in the outpatient practice. What, what we'd really like to do is create a dedicated line on the schedule, which for us is just a clinical reading rotation, that in the outpatient practice that really all that person is doing all day long is coronary disease, right? And, and just have a focal that's not structural, not pediatric, just adult coronary disease. And we think that that's a, that'll be a way as we move from where we are right now in the, we're in kind of dipping our toe in the water with regard to quantitative plaque imaging. As the, as the plaque imaging revolution occurs, we want to be able to, to promote that with dedicated individuals who that's all they have to think about during the day. Again, as you know, that can be a complex, there are complex issues to sort out with regard to plaque quantification and some of the qualitative aspects of those, of those patients as well. So that's, that's where we see the next growth. And, and we really would like to have, again, as I mentioned, a dedicated service where people are not are able to focus their effort and energy on that rather than being distracted by all the other pieces of of a robust uh, cardiovascular CT practice. That's where we see the next leap forward in our practice. Excellent. Jerry, Eric, this conversation has been fantastic. Do you all have any final thoughts before we close? Well, I have just one, and it's kind of directed at your audience who maybe are not doing any cardiac CT right now or much, and uh, primarily to radiology residents or, or radiology staff out there who are somehow they are reluctant to get into cardiac CT, either they're busy enough, or they say, that's just getting to be too complex. Uh, I'd beg to differ. I mean, I'm not the sharpest blade in the, the <laughs> knife in the drawer, and, and I can handle something that has only four chambers and two, two arteries, right, you know? So I always, we have a general radiology meeting every year, and it's general radiologists out in the audience. And about one of the last talks I gave, I said, I'm going to show you 10 relatively rare cardiac cases that I bet you all can diagnose mm. because the fact that you read CT. And that's the big thing. If you read CT, you can read cardiac CT. And one of the cases I showed was a great big right ventricular hemangioma. It was incidental finding on a young guy who got an echo and got uh, sent to us. And anyway, I, had, I showed him a non-contrast, a contrast exam, and delayed. And what he had was a blood density mass attached to his right ventricle that enhanced peripherally with a kind of a nodular pattern, and then later on went to a complete blood density again, that would contrast enhanced density. And I go, this thing is, you know, has a benign appearance, right? You would all agree with what benign versus malignant look like. And it's not interfering with this guy's function. It's totally incidental. I go, what is it? And basically nobody said anything. So I said, all right, now put it in the liver. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a mangioma. Well, yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's a mangioma. So these people have the skills. Mm. You know, an abscess in the liver is like an abscess in the pericardium. Calcium and, and luminal disease is the same in the coronaries as it is in the legs. So it's just a little bit different imaging. And so I, I, I want people to get into this. 
because it's just going to keep growing. As CT gets better and better with less and less radiation, you know, there's no such thing as a one-stop shop, but this one's going to get fairly close. And it's just somehow we can figure out to do Doppler by CT, then we take it all. <laughs> Yeah, I have, Praveen, I have very little to add to that. I think that we who work in the cardiovascular arena, we understand that we're in competition t- in today's market for trainees, right? So this, again, continuing to demystify cardiac CT and cardiovascular CT and making sure that it's an appealing career for folks who are in particular in the early stages of their radiology training, super important for us to, to continue to grow and be robust as a, as a subspecialty of radiology. Awesome. Thank you both so much for joining us on the series here of building a cardiac CT program. This has been extremely insightful. I think our listeners are going to absolutely love it. Thank you again. Thanks for being You bet. To our listeners out there, thank you, of course, for tuning in. If you like what you hear from us on the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe to us. This helps others out there find our content. Once again, this is the Donut of Destiny. Cheers. Cheers.